So hi, uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Howard, and I'm presenting on proof of work today. Uh, so this is going to be the overview. Um, I'm first going to go into some background, uh, then talk about some of the current consensus protocols and possibly where they fall short, um, and then talk about uh, our work, uh, some analysis, and then conclude. So first off on the background, um, a blockchain. What is a blockchain? It's like a glorified linked list where you have some data and a reference to the previous guy. Um, you use a hash of the previous block to get you your ad address of reference. And uh, yeah, this is how we treat it. Uh, there's obviously different types of blockchains with different constructions and different parameters and specifications, but abstractly, this is how we're thinking about it. Um, when it comes to consensus, the goal is you have you know, some transactions and uh, you want to agree that A paid B and didn't pay C, for example. Uh, you want to prevent <coughs> double spending. You want to ensure that uh, everybody is on the same page about what happened and what didn't happen. And uh, you know, with uh, current approaches like proof of work, for example, Bitcoin, um, if you get two, if you get a fork and you have two chains now where they all uh, have uh, claims on different transactions, then the one that wins is the one that's longer. And the software is designed such that it will always build on top of the longer one. So eventually the shorter one uh, uh, gets ignored and dies off. And uh, you can pretty much get mathematical confirmation about this within five to six uh, uh, blocks. So <clears throat> what's the problem with proof of work? Uh, first off, uh, with the current uh, uh, version we use in Bitcoin, it takes about 10 minutes. Um, additionally, you have to do a lot of work. Uh, it takes a lot of energy. And uh, the computation that we're doing is completely meaningless. Uh, there's no reason for it. And uh, it's, uh, it's just wasted just to get a nonce that gets us the exact value to match the difficulty at that given time. So the idea is that maybe we can do better with this. And uh, there's these things called the trusted execution environments um, that, that have come about and are being developed by several companies. They're, all, they're actually shipped in uh, every major uh, uh, CPU uh, model that was released in the past year. So if you got a MacBook in the past year or a laptop in the past year, your computer probably has uh, some form of it, be it SGX or whatnot, in included. Um, so abstractly, like when I first heard about this, I was like, I'm not exactly sure like what are uh, trusted execution environments, TEEs. And uh, the way I think about it is, is this, like if you have an iPhone and uh, you use the fingerprint sensor, Touch ID, like your fingerprint, they say Apple never saves it. It's stored somewhere on your device. That place where it's stored is called a secure enclave, and it's only on your phone. And uh, who has access to it? Well, specifically, in this case, the CPU has access to it, and nobody else. It's basically like a gatekeeper to a portion of RAM memory. And uh, this affords us a lot of new benefits that uh, in the past we couldn't have, because processes could go and try to take memory from other processes by you know, accessing wrong parts of address, and uh, thereby getting data leaks. And, uh, this is a, through a scheme where that's not possible. Only the CPU can do it to the correct area. And we have uh, procedures for attestation, quotes, reports, proofs, to ensure that uh, computations that are run inside of that part of memory uh, are done correctly and that uh, nobody has interfered with it. So some background on SGX, which is Intel's architecture for this. This is the whole scheme um, of how it works. And uh, it's based on uh, certain trade-offs and certain benefits that that uh, come with the design. Um, so this is like your computer, and uh, there are these fuses which have your crypto it's the cryptographic fuses which, which link your CPU's identity. Um, those are controlled and made by Intel. So there are some trust issues that Intel is the only one who has access and understanding of these. And in theory, if they really wanted to, they could go do something and like you know mess up a bunch of or, or steal a bunch of data. Uh, th the truth of the matter is it's a very controversial area and the different sides say different things. Um, but for our framework of consideration, like our threat models, we trust that any platform vendor can create a, a trusted execution environment, use it. And our model also, uh, as you'll see later, uh, has pr uh, preventative measures against compromised trusted execution environments. So when it comes to validating that something is right, um, there's this provisioning service and attestation service. And that these are basically uh, responsible for generating reports and checking. Like you can go to a cloud service provided by Intel and say, hey, I have a report, an attestation. Can you tell me if this is correct or not? And it'll, it'll say yes or no, basically. And it's for verification that, that things are, are running the way that you expect them to. 
So remote attestation is one, uh, one can verify that a specific computation ran on suitable hardware and produced a specific result. That's very broad and very general and very simple, but that's kind of the beauty of it. It's, uh, you can basically do anything in there and uh, they'll tell you, hey, like you, this thing was in the right access procedure. There's nothing faulty about it. So currently, there's a, there's a slew of uh, consensus protocols that the most widely known is proof of work, where you know, we do this SHA work to get this number with the nonce. And uh, there's also things like proof of stake or proof of burn. Um, additionally, there's like uh, Byzantine fault tolerance and uh, like PBFT from 1999, like this talk. Um, there's, also this, there's also a recent uh, project called Intel Satu Lake. And uh, this is very similar in that they're using SGX to do the desired uh, uh, proof uh, uh, protocol. And um, it touches on many similar things that we'll talk on, but it doesn't introduce the, the, the whole luck uh, portion of things. It's basically using the, the trusted time service that I'll get into in a bit. Um, each of these has their, their upsides and their downsides. For example, with a proof of work, um, as I just mentioned, a lot of meaningless computation, a lot of wasted energy is slow. Proof of stake, proof of burn, these are, these are very nice candidates, and I think uh, Ethereum is actually going to be adopting proof of stake very soon. Uh, but again, we don't have very strong security bounds on these things, and uh, we also aren't very sure on their, their security and integrity out, out in the wild. Um, when it comes to PBFT, there's, there's a lot of issues, actually. Um, you have to reach um, a consensus uh, within... Uh, with a scalable uh, scalable size. So what I mean is uh, you kind of have to know how many participants are in network and uh, communication is the biggest uh, 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 bottleneck in that everyone has to kind of talk to everybody and uh, you get this just exponential growth very, very fast. Um, yeah, question? Can I ask why, why companies are including, specifically Intel, why are they including these trusted execution environments? Like I'm assuming it's not specifically for uh, blockchain network. So why are they yeah. why are they on your CPUs? Why are they supporting that? Yeah, so these are like I think that they're they're really helpful. Um, the the reason for it is there's a lot of applications that require security that require you to be in an environment that you know nobody else will be able to access, and uh, this is like one of the ways that they can do it. Um, so if you have sensitive, let's say, healthcare data, or you have like I don't know, confidential government data, and you're running an application that's processing this, like it's using this as, as part of its application, you don't exactly want another application to be able to snoop in and look at what you're doing. And if you need those types of guarantees, then this is the environment for it. Additionally, um, depending on the architecture, you can also have guarantees about control, access control, like uh, who and who cannot uh, uh, see the stuff in it, get access. So for example, with, uh, with your phone, like your fingerprint, you don't exactly want that accidentally being read by another application and get, getting leaked to the web because you can always change your password, but you can't change your fingerprint. And uh, so in those cases, it, this is really, really useful. Um, so you might, have a, you might have a compromised computer, like a computer with viruses on it, and still be able to like, have passwords or accounts like on that computer that like, can't be accessed by the virus because they've been in the safety part. Uh, yeah, so like if you're running an application and it's using this, this, um, and you're typing your your password and it's processing it through it and it's on there, then yeah, it can't be read. Uh, there's basically like walled off gardens, and each each one of these is called a secure enclave. It's basically segmenting portions of RAM to do this, and uh, uh, you can summon uh, large numbers of enclaves, and uh, all all sorts of applications can take advantage of this. So it's in the early days, but. Right now, pretty much if your computer has it, there's probably some application that's using it uh, with, with or without your knowledge. So our work. Um, so I'll talk you through three different design choices iteratively, and then uh, that will lead up to a proof of luck. So let's start with the most basic. Everybody is uh, to some degree familiar with proof of work. You, and if we just wrap it into a black box and say, hey, there's this function, we have some difficulty and go and generate me the, the guy that gets me the satisfaction for this difficulty. You know, that's like a like a 10 minute function that's just in a box, right? Well, what if we just you know add a guy on top and add a guy below and says, hey, like invoke into TEE this method, and then here, hey, return from TEE and check. Then we have TEE proof of work. And uh, that that's all it is. So now you're doing proof of work in a secure enclave and uh, everything is uh, is happy. Um, that's the most basic way of using a, a, 
a trusted execution environment. And uh, the benefits are you can, you can restrict the use of ASICs because you're saying that everybody that's running this has to have SGX in this case. And uh, anybody that doesn't cannot participate in the whole mining process. Um, so currently there are no, as far as I know, any ASIC miners that use SGX or have it built in. And there's no plans to do that since it's a very slow process to begin with. Um, additionally, uh, you can, yeah, you can do a lot of these, these like basic things with just a little basic wrapper. But let's think about this more abstractly. Like, what are we trying to do? We're trying to say, people who whoever's mining the block should say, hey, I have some way of uniquely saying I made this block, and I took it took me time, and I legitimately did this. So, this this work that proof of work does is really quite meaningless, and uh, we don't actually use it at the end. It's just just there that's stored as proof. So what if instead we just did proof of time? Like That work itself was meaningless to begin with, so why don't we just wait 10 minutes, and then a guy says, hey, I have SGX, here's my attestation to say, like, this is my CPU, like, you can identify me and my CPU, and boom, like, it's like the same thing, but without having to, to go through all of that wasted energy. And so the machines that you're using for this can now spend their, their CPU cycles doing something more meaningful, like, I don't know, finding the next largest prime number or whatnot. Um, so like, that's an interesting approach. And um, what we, so like the way that we, we can do this is by using this thing called monotonic counters. Uh, monotonic counters are provided uh, as part of uh, trusted execution environments. And uh, they basically are like, like you know, in a for loop you have i and i plus plus. And it's just a counter. It just it just tells you that you're 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 incrementing, and the reason why that's important is because when you go in and you check the time after you checked it, like you, you want to increment and make sure that you're not looking at old data. You don't want someone to do a replay attack. In essence, uh, there is a replay attack in this whole thing uh, because let's say you generate this proof says, "Hey, I have this S SGX uh, uh, module and I've made this proof and." We're now going to add this in. Well, later on, some guy can come back and say, hey, I already did this before. And that they're just reusing the same guy over the same proof because it's valid. Uh, you don't want that. So you, you include a monotonic counter to ensure uh, that, that you're accessing the right guy. Um, yeah. So then it makes you question, like, why is it that we're waiting this time? Like, 10 minutes is, is a lot of time in Bitcoin's case. And uh, you, know, you, you certainly have to wait a certain period for synchronization reasons, for communication reasons, but you don't need to just like wait for no apparent reason. And so like time in and of itself was originally for ensuring that you're spending time to do work uh, to calculate some meaningless thing that gets you the right answer for a proof. But now this whole structure doesn't even exist. We can just say like, hey, I have a, a correct unit. And if we just say randomly allocate and choose one guy, on each round to be the miner, then everybody that participates can get still get an equal chance of getting a reward as long as they just vouch that they have an SGX uh, uh, enabled CPU. So that's the whole whole idea about this is that instead we just generate an attestation, and um, by by doing this uh, we can just use our CPUs to vote, and uh, by voting we just choose uh, uh, one guy each round for uh, mining uh, a block. So this is like a rough breakdown of the, the comparisons, um, and it's pretty self-explanatory, I think. So I'll move on. So, so using all of that iterative approach that we just thought about, like this gets us to proof of luck, and uh, we can use the exact services that we talked about um, in order to do proof of luck. So the basic idea is that every every guy generates a random number. And this random number is your luck value. The higher the luck value, the better. Um, and we go. Let's let's talk about this through rounds. So in each round, let's say there's ten ten people. They each generate a number. The largest number wins. That largest number guy's block gets appended to the blockchain. Next round, you know everybody generates a random number, and again the largest guy wins, mines a block and, and gets appended to the blockchain. And so that that's kind of like, like the protocol that we're going about. Um, so when it comes to this, uh, like naively, uh, okay, I kind of walked you guys through it already, but naively you generate a random number, you get an attestation and that's it. What's the problems? Well, 
first off, um, it's kind of like proof of work. We don't have rounds here yet. We're just generating random numbers and, and generating an attestation and an ending. And so you can just keep iterating and everyone just says, hey, I got a larger number, I got a larger number, I got a larger number. And it's a never ending race to just get the larger number and have their block get, get added. So it becomes almost like proof of work because you're always just doing all this work for, for no reason. You had a question, Jordan? How do you ensure that the number is random? <laughs> so we'll get to that in a second. But the short answer is uh, it's, it's also a provided service. Um, you, can, you can basically just do like pseudo random number generation um, but pseudo-random with such a large financial uh, scale doesn't exactly seem such a good idea. <laughs> yes, well, you, you, there's there's like certain there's, there's certain constructions that are better than others. Um, like that's like not exactly the the target of like our concerns here. We just assume like if there was one. Go ahead. So the trusted execution environment ensures people aren't just like coming up with a really high number and sending that and saying it's random. So what yeah, we'll do is sure that, that they randomly generate these. So what we'll do is we'll generate the random number in the, the actual enclave. Okay. And uh, basically that means that me as the, the user, I'm not the one that's invoking it. The CPU is invoking it on my behalf uh, with a with a provided service function, and uh, that number I I trust is correct because uh, it's invoked in the right thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, also another uh, SGX service is, is time. So like with the proof of time that you saw earlier, that is uh, using a time service that, that they offer. So the solution is let's wait some time so that people are not just trying to jump, hop on top of each other, say, hey, I got the bigger number, I got the bigger number. And uh, we'll just wait some time, some, some fixed time, and this is going to be the value that we use. And so this is already rate limiting people. Um, but there is another issue, which is that if we have unsynchronized clocks, uh, we, we waste a lot of luck, meaning if you have a lot of participants and they're all just really bad network players and they like to delay and just like, I don't know why, they're just being mean to each other. Um, you, you can get to the case where like everybody generated some luck thing and they mined a block, but it turns out that there was a better block, so I have to discard my current block and accept theirs because for this iteration, this one was the better one, the winning one. Then everybody's doing some wasted work. So like to just model it, like, hey, this guy does it. Like they're all sending and they're all saying like, hey, this is the next one. <laughs> but then this guy comes on and says, hey, I, I got some better one. Well, uh, what do we do? So the solution is to continue receiving um, until the round time interval. And after waiting, you have a chance to do a switch. So, oops. So, you, you you have a period where you can receive blocks, and if you receive blocks and you see that you get some some really good options, like you, you have a winner basically, then you just call proof of luck mine on the existing blocks, and you append this guy, and you do the whole process, and and you're done. If otherwise, uh, you have to set your round block to be the parent. You wait your round time, and you do the mining yourself. Um, this this approach then allows uh, for not having all that wasted and spent computation because you're just legitimately computing when you need to and accepting when you don't need to. So one slight optimization that we did is with this guy here. So as you can see, we added this sleep f of l. So a random value, our l, is uh, in a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. And uh, our, our sleeping procedure is just 1 over L. Uh, so good luck values, uh, large luck values, let's, let's say it's close to 1, then you get a very, very small sleep time. And uh, if you have a very bad luck number, you're sleeping for a very long time. In fact, you'd be sleeping for minutes. Uh, so this is just a slight optimization to promote good blocks to uh, propagate on the network before bad blocks do. And uh, therefore, the good blocks have a better chance of being appended as the next block uh, on the blockchain. Um, so yeah, this is again what I just said. Uh, L, we, we do a, a uniform sampling between 0 and 1. And uh, attacker M splits itself from the rest of the network. A threat model is that the attacker cannot compromise the TEE, uh, cannot split on his participants. Then let's say we have H blocks. Then between these H blocks, these are going to be our L values for uh, who's the good guy. This is the good guy, that's the bad guy. Okay, cool. 
So th that's our setup. Um, then let's say that capital L of H is going to be the sum of the differences between the good guy and the bad guy. And so if, if L of H is less than or equal to zero, then we're basically saying that the attacker is winning. Like he, he's dominating the network. Um, well, what is, what is this probability? So we can actually bound it with the Chernoff bound. And uh, it's just the expectation uh, of exponentials. Um, we, we just plug in this guy. And uh, across all the values for, for different s's, we can see that um, this number, well, by math, we can separate it. And then by math, we can, we can just set it equal to, uh, to the power of h, uh, the products. And uh, eventually, uh, you see that for an optimal value, let's say it's, uh, it's going to be less than 1. So your probability that this happens is, is going to be bounded by some less than 1. In fact, uh, you can, you're basically saying that it's exponentially small probability that uh, this uh, minority of attackers are going to win. And uh, that gives us confidence that this is good. But remember, our threat model that, we, that I had just said is that the attacker cannot com uh, compromise TEEs. Um, so that's assuming that things are good. Now, what if, I don't know, Intel goes rogue. They like, just like, hey, let, let's go steal all the money. Uh, well, you know, there's also approaches for that. Um, so let's say we have a compromised TEE. Um, this system that we did can actually be modularized and scaled up. So instead of saving the luck value of just like one guy, let's consider the luck value of M guys. Or, yeah, they said M. So let's say M is equal to five, and you have five guys come in. You get five different luck values. Instead of picking the best luck value, just pick the worst luck value. And the reason for that is because if you're an attacker and you compromise and you want your blocks to be appended to your, your, your transactions uh, to, be the, to be stored forever, you're obviously going to give the highest luck value uh, because you want that to be selected. So if you have, I don't know, five, five guys, then four of them are bad. Four of them are all going to send ones. But the honest one has a very low chance of actually getting the value of one. So they will have some number between zero and one, and that one will be the chosen one. In this case, you see there's two compromised. So if we choose the lowest guy, we get, we get, uh, the, we get a correct behavior again. So in conclusion, then, like if you think about the properties, like we get ASIC resistance. Uh, it's certainly energy efficient, uh, time efficient as well. And uh, our, our construction is permissionless. There, it it can also be permissioned. Uh, we we didn't have this the space to to discuss about that uh, in our paper, but. There, there is a construction that you can do for that. And uh, it's, also, it's also very scalable um, because of the limited communication bandwidth uh, that, that, that you need. Um, and uh, as for the assumptions, uh, we assume that participants have access to suitable TE hardware. As you know, all consumer laptops now are starting to ship with this, so th this is easily accessible. And uh, TE programs can detect concurrent invocations, and they can also generate unbiased random numbers. So, that's that's a part of the uh, the trusted time services or trusted services of a TEE. Yeah. Yes. About uh, what time are we talking? Like, I mean, uh, how long uh, will it take to generate one block? So, uh, so I built like a proof of concept uh, with Sunny, and uh, we've been able to get it down to about seven or eight seconds for each round, and uh, it seems to be reliably communicating on roughly. Anywhere from ten to hundred uh, uh, clients. And, uh, so like anywhere, seven to ten seconds was the time that we did. Okay. Yeah. And uh, how many transactions can we write in a block? Um, so blocks are rather arbitrarily defined in our in our convention. Um, it's you could you could write whatever you want. Usually, for any yeah. transactions, we just made a proof of concept to show that it comes from something. Yeah, like, like you can also use this, like transactions can be stored and, and we did store transactions. However, the data in it is just a, a arbitrary uh, uh, values. I, I understand, but uh, you know, it is very important to uh, generate blocks uh, quickly uh, since we want to store uh, lots of information because uh, blockchain uh, and cryptocurrency is now really um, popular and more yeah. and more information people want to store more and more people want to store their information there yes so we end up with re really huge amount of data yes that has to be absolutely stored there. and we need to make sure that we generate enough blocks because 
uh, those technologies uh, in finance, like I'm talking about frequency, high frequency trading, right. they cannot be implemented in um, in uh, uh, via uh, Bitcoin sure. because it's too slow. And Ethereum is a lot faster, and on top of that, it stores like times of more data in its blocks. So Ethereum is, I think, around 13, 14 seconds right now. And yeah, but, but if um, here uh, less data is stored than in block of Ethereum, then yeah. Ethereum is more efficient from this point of view. So I'm not sure the extent of use for blockchains in HFT, but I'm not sure if it's supposed to be used for, for that. Um, the current designs like certainly don't, don't uh, allow for it, as you just mentioned, and uh, I'm not sure if this design is meant for that. But it is it is supposed to be for for cross communications and at least at these fixed uh, seven to ten second intervals you guys can reach consensus and and have state about what is what is the current state of our blockchain. Yeah, we haven't really tested it with data inside, so we don't know how that will actually mm -hmm. I had a couple questions. Like, sure. Is that block time like scalable with uh, like a larger network? Yeah, that's something that, that we we ourselves are asking. Um, we tried it first on roughly ten, then I tried it on about a hundred and. Uh, Things are working fine. Uh, we 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 got it to like uh, the, well. I just submit random gibberish, roughly a uh, hundred byte uh, uh, transactions, and um, this thing seems to be going fine at least up until the ten thousandth block, which is what, what I run it to. That's impressive. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. So I'm trying to think. How is this much better than the proof of ownership? Besides the fact that if you scale up on CPUs, it's harder to determine that you're going to have much more luck. I can go back to that. So proof of ownership has some scalability issues. I can take this offline. It's like we're, we're very little running over time. All right. Uh, thank you so much.